Morning, church family. I want to welcome and thank everyone for joining us this morning. Our lesson topic for this morning is Made Blind to See. You know, our society and the Bible also, and also our language and sometimes the way we use words, we use the word see in other ways other than uh, physical sight. We often hear phrases such as, uh, you see what I'm saying. Or we use phrases such as, I can see that now when someone is explaining something to us. Or I see where you are going with this. Or I don't see what you're asking or talking about. When we examine how these words see is being used in this context, we come to the conclusion that the word mean understand. You understand what I'm saying? I can understand that now. I understand where you're going with this. So I don't understand what you're asking me or talking about. But you know, when we look over in Luke 11.35 in the NIV, they use this phrase, see to it that. And we see the word see in that context is used a little bit different. It talks about being careful, be careful, watch out, take heed, take care. When we look at the word blind, blind means just the opposite of see. If we say see is understanding, then blind has to be the opposite of understanding, the lack of understanding. Saul's spiritual blindness Saul was spiritually blind before he started his journey to Damascus. How bad was he? Well, Saul, he was very bad before he could understand, before he could see. Uh, he was a regular enemy to Christianity. He did the utmost to root out Christianity uh, by persecuting all that embraced it. Uh, Paul, however, could see just enough just enough to be concerned about the righteousness of the law. You know, he was a blameless person. He was a man of no ill, Ill morals, but he was a blasphemer of Christ, a persecutor of Christians. First Timothy 1 and 13, Paul says, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I act in innocent and unbelief. In other words, Saul didn't see it. He was blind. He was spiritually blind. He didn't understand. Christ said in John 16, 2, they will put you out of the synagogue. He says, in fact, there's going to be a time going to be coming when anyone who killed you will think they're offering a service to God. Basically, Christ was saying, they won't understand. They won't see it. They won't see what you're talking about. They will be spiritually blind. Over in Acts 26 and 9, Paul says, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. You know, the human eye is the most valuable organ man has for interacting with the world around him. Eyes are used in nearly everything a person does. The expert says that the eye doesn't actually see objects, but it does see the light that they give off. It says, the expert says, rays of lights enter the body through a clear tissue and are interpreted as electrical signals that are sent to the brain to produce visual images. Although the eye is quite small, it is powerful enough to see distant objects such as the stars and tiny objects such as a grain of sand. A Christian knows his eyes are one of the greatest ministry tools. His eyes can communicate genuine interest and compassion. His eyes also means of collecting vital information to be used for encouragement. You know, the eyes can see in bright light or dim light, but one of the things it cannot see is in the absence of light. The same is true of spiritual eyesight. When Jesus said, I am the light of the world, he revealed that no one can see life clearly without knowing him. 
Those who are in spiritual darkness believe they can see. But their image of the world around them is draped in lob sense. They're like this cartoon character, those of you who remember Mr. Magoo, who would confidence stroll through life oblivious to the fact that he courted disaster at every step. Spiritual blindness. Sight is the most precious of all the human senses. And the fear of losing one's eyesight is the most terrifying of all disabilities. But greater than the loss of physical sight, however, is the danger of spiritual blindness. This point was clearly made by Jesus during an encounter with a group of Pharisees who were upset because he healed a blind man on the Sabbath. I like to just paraphrase that event over there in John, the ninth chapter. And I want you to pay attention to the lack of understanding, the blindness, and the ones that had the understanding, the sight. The Bible in it, in, in the Bible says over in chapter 9, it says, when Jesus was leaving the temple, he passed a man who was blind from birth. His disciple asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that caused him to be blind? Now, this was a universal opinion among the Jews that calamity and disasters of all kinds were the effect of sin. And Jesus answered, says, neither had this man sinned nor his parents sinned. And I'm going to give you the reason. The reason this man was blind was so that they might so that they and us and all that follow and read this, that we might see how great and how wonderful are the works of God. We know when Christ comes into our life, we can see his divine providence, his divine guidance, and his divine care. Jesus also stated to them that, you know, I have to go about and do my father's business while it is day, while I'm living. Because he says, when night comes when death comes it will be too late but notice two things here what the pharisees saw in the blind man the pharisees saw sin what did christ see in the blind man christ saw opportunity then christ proceeded to heal the blind man by putting mud on his eyes made from the christ's saliva and dirt then Christ gave him instructions on a specific place to go and what to do. See, the man had to do his part in this process. We have to do our part in this process. We see three things happening here. First, the man had to have a little trust there. He had to have some faith. Number two, the man followed Christ's instructions. Number three, he was rewarded. He was rewarded with his sight. So when those that saw the, the man that was once blind and that they knew that was a beggar and was familiar with his history, they started asking questions, is this the same man? And some were saying, no, it's not the same man. It's just somebody that looks like him. But the blind man was saying, no, 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 no. I am he. I am he. I am the man that you saw that was blind from birth. So they said, how did you get your sight? Interesting, the blind man told them. Basically what he said, I just followed the instructions of this man called Jesus. Well, they didn't believe him. What did they do? They took him to the Pharisees. The Pharisees asked the same question and got the same answer. But the Pharisees came to a conclusion. This man called Jesus is not from God. He did not keep the Sabbath day. He's a sinner. How can a sinner perform such sign? You know, blindness can cause division. Matter of fact, John and John 9, 16 says, and there was division among them. So they asked the blind man, what's your take on this man called Jesus? What do you think about this man called Jesus? The blind man answered, he says, he's a prophet. Now the Pharisees, they still didn't believe him. 
So they sent for his parents, and his parents came and they said, Is this your son who's born blind? And if it is, how did he get his sight? Parents confirmed, Yes, he's my son. He's our son that was born blind. But how he got his sight, you have to ask him. So they went back and they asked him, man that was once blind to ask him again. And this time they wanted to know, be truthful now, be truthful before God. How did you get your sight? Well, after answering this question consistently for a number of times, the blind man asked him a question. Well, you know, you, you asked me this question. I keep giving you the same answer. Why do you want to know about this? Do you want to become a disciple? disciple of Jesus. Well, they seemed to be getting up, they seemed to get a little upset with that, didn't they? Because they said, we are disciples of Moses, you are disciples of Jesus, and they start throwing insults at him. The man said, all I can tell you is what happened to me. And he preached to him a little bit. This seemed to really get under the Pharisee's skin because they said, you know, you were, you, you are a sinner from birth and you're going to teach us. And what did they do? Exactly what Jesus has said. They threw him out of the synagogue. Jesus said, I came to declare the condition of men to show them their duties and their dangerous ways. Jesus sums up this whole event and two sentences. He says, they which see not, in the spiritual sense, is those who are blind and ignorant of, by sin, who, whose mind have been darkened, but, but, who has a desire to see. And Jesus said, they might see. They might be able to discern the path of truth, of duty, and of salvation. And then he says, they which see, they are those who suppose they see, who are proud, self-confidence, and despise the truth, the know-it-alls. Jesus says, they might be made blind. The teaching of Jesus was irritate them, and their pride and their opposition to him would confirm them more and more in their erroneous views. So where the teaching of Christ does not soften the heart, it hardens the heart. Where the teaching of Christ does not convert, sinks them into deeper blindness and condemnation. When a person is baptized, he's a new creature. All things have passed away and all things have become new according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We can see our spouse, our children, our in-laws, our neighbors, our bosses, our enemies, in a total new way. We're able to see our purpose and our goals a lot clearer. We can see them. We can see the hymn, Amazing Grace, with new meaning as one sings, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. A Christian looked through caring eyes, Although there's times and places of care and interventions between Christians, no one has the right or duty to mold hunt over in Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Christians are encouraged and should look at others through care and eyes. Personal characters that is first perceived as negative may be positive when examined in the light of love. Now, without being naive, Christians and carriages should make it a habit to put the best possible construction on any situation. The Christian discourager see John is stubborn. The Christian encourager consider him persistent and determined. The critic see Jane is bossy. The consoler see her as an assertive person who gets results. The fault finder find says Bob talks too much. Uh, the positive person say he is outgoing and friendly a real people person. A Christian discourages like a doctor with poor bedside manners. 
Rather than seeing a patient, he said, diagnose are a source of income. And personal physicians can heal sick bodies, but they fail miserably in treating the fear, the anxiety, and the loneliness that ail their clientele. In contrast, a good doctor see patients as a friend and treat the whole person. Christian encourages see people while complainers only see problems. Becoming a Christian encourages putting on a pair of glasses for the first time. Everything looks more beautiful when seen in clear focus. A nearsighted child who's fitted with corrective lenses is thrilled to see leaves on the tree and fish in the stream. Christian encourages, Christian encouragement is corrective lens for the soul. It's amazing what one can see with a loving focus. A Christian encourager can always see something to affirm in others. Hey, do they have a good attitude? Or do they take pride in their appearance? Do they possess a special talent or ability? If they cannot be praised for completed action, can they be congratulated for their attempt? Encouragers notice the effort and the progress, not just perfect performance. They can see what people are capable of and how things can be with a little encouragement to sustain their faltering footstep. Discourage Christians and discouraging people are convinced that their views of the world is true. And sometimes they believe that their views of the world is their only views. Their inability to see life properly is evidence of spiritual eye disease. Just as cataract clouds the vision and interfere with a person's daily activities, Sin can obscure the ability to see others, other people, and life opportunities in a helpful way. As I close, I want to share a couple of articles with you that were shared with me. They were shared with me by Gail Elliott. Most of us know Gail. She worshiped with us for some time. And she got the articles from someone else who has connection to our congregation. Doy Moyer. I don't know Doy. I would imagine Jesse and Glory and the Hogan's and maybe Carla and some of the older members know Doy. I am told that Doy is Forrest Moyer's son. And his mom, for those that might know Pat Stevenson, that was his mom. He's a minister in Alabama now. But she shared these two articles I'd like to share with you with the point that I'm trying to bring to you today. Doy says that Christians should never divide over the things that divide America or any earthly nation as a whole because what unites Christian is far greater than what unites or divide Americans. I'm not saying Christians cannot be Americans or they should not seek to be good citizens doing what is best for the nation which I could directly tie to being the kind of people God called us to be, 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16. He said, yet the citizenship of Christian transcends all earthly citizenship, Philippians 3, 20 through 21. And Christians are found throughout all nations, Acts 10, 34, 35, and Revelation 21, 24. Christians existed long before America. And should this nation cease, and one day it will, Christians will outlast it. The kingdom of God shall always stand, according to Daniel 2.44. The kingdoms of earth pass away one by one, but the kingdom of heaven remains. If we allow earthly concerns to divide us as Christians, we are denying our, greatest, our greater citizenship. What unites Christians should be the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Through him, all his peoples are related as brothers and sisters when we stay true to him. There are no physical national boundaries. There's no walls. There's no segregation, partialities, or political divisions. We unite, and when we unite in Christ, we put aside what divides the world in favor of the unity of the spirit 
in the bonds of peace, Ephesians 4, 3. Let us not then speak evil of our brothers and sisters. Let us rather be devoted to one another in love, outdoing one another in honor and setting aside our own personal preference in favor of building one another up in the most holy faith. So what will you do today to build up another? The other article, it says, I fear that Christians are missing one of the greatest opportunities we have seen in our lifetime to testify to the world of the power and glory of God. One of the significant takeaways from the book of Revelation is the emphasis of the testimony of the faithful witness who give their lives to bear witness to the nation with the goal of bringing the nations to faith. God's people are meant to be a blessing to the nation, testifying to the power of Christ in their lives so that others who see how Christians face trials and death will also want to come to Christ. What do we do? Well, we bicker. We complain. We fight over masks and lockdowns and have link wars about what experts are good and what experts are bad. We fuss about athletes and their version of protests. Doy says, I don't know what the outcome of all this will be. We all have opinions, often quite strong. But I know we will make different judgments about how to proceed. And it is doubtful that one more link or one more complaining post or mean will change our mind. Only God knows where it is all going. But we need to be asking ourselves this. Is this what our king wants us to be doing? Are people keeping Christ lifted up and exalting through these things? In all of this, are we testifying about Jesus Christ? Are we showing the power of the crucified and risen Savior in our lives? Are we pointing to the nations? Are we pointing the nations to Jesus? Are we giving others reason to glorify God? Or do we fan the fuel of hatred towards Christians by behaving and we need to be a when well, we need to rise above? What are people seeing? It's an opportunity, and I fear the Lord peoples are missing it. And he says, I am too. So let us be devoted today to showing forth the testimony of our Lord in our lives. The gospel is for healing of this nation. And this will not be accomplished by our strife, division over the world's concern, and devouring one another in social media. Lights need to be shining, Matthew 5, 12 through 14. Philip. Uh, Philippians 2, 14 to 16, love, love needs to be followed, flowing. As the deer paint for the water brooks, so must our soul be painted for the Lord. Let us seize this opportunity, beloved. I urge you, the sojourners and exiles, exiles, to abstain from the passion of the flesh, which wages war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you, you as evildoer, they may see your good deed and glorify God on the day of vocation. There might be some in our midst that might want to become a member of Christ's kingdom. The Bible tells us how to do that. It says we must hear, according to John 5, 24, believe in Hebrews 11, 6, and repent of our sins, Luke 13 and 3. Confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God, Acts 8, 37, and then be baptized, according to Acts. So with that, if anyone wants to let it be known, you might raise your hand or use the chat box and we will address any of your concerns. Get back over to our song leader. 